Hello everyone, we're honored to join you today to present our talk, Reproductive and Sexual Health for Trans People Living with HIV, Researcher, Healthcare Provider, and Community Perspectives. Throughout this presentation, you will hear the voices of Ashley Lacombe Duncan and Yasmin Prasad on behalf of our team, which also includes our colleague Sue Harlovich. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge all the ancestral traditional territories, land and waters across the land are referred to as Canada, where we work, play, live and live. We are currently in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, which is the traditional territory of the Wendat, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee, and most recently the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Our research team has put together a resource list for people to learn more about Indigenous peoples, reconciliation, and allyship in Canada. We welcome everyone to use and share the link. Over the next 30 minutes, we will tell you a bit about who we are and what brings us together, where we have been, including our research conducted to date, specifically focusing on two studies, the Canadian HIV Women Sexual and Reproductive Health Cohort Study and the Transgender Education for Affirmative and Competent HIV Healthcare, or CHIWOS and TEACH for short. We will share a bit about our future research, recognizing that there's still many gaps. Then we will spend some time discussing practice, implications and resources for us all to support trans people living with HIV, sexual and reproductive health care from holistic trauma-informed and trans-affirming perspective. The three of us share a long history of working together as researchers with CHIWOS, but we also hold many different roles. Ashley is a social worker by background and conducts community-based research focused on the understanding and reducing barriers to access to care, including HIV care for LGBTQ people. Sue is a primary healthcare nurse practitioner with over 20 years of experience and a clinical focus on trans care. And Yasmin is a member of the 519 education and training team that has been providing education on 2S LGBTQ related issues and taking up trans activism for the past 15 years. She also provides programming specifically for trans people of color. We all hold many diverse positionalities and continually strive to recognize our privileges and to reflect on the identities we share and those we do not share with the communities we serve and research. Chiros laid the groundwork for the Trans Women and HIV Research Initiative, or TWIRI for short. We know it's a lot of acronyms, a community-based research initiative that we are all part of, led by Dr. Mona Lofty and Yasmin through Women's College Hospital in Toronto, Canada. TWIRI envisions a world that proactively educates itself regarding the experiences of trans women living with HIV and has the resources to do so. We aim to achieve this mission through creating and promoting accessible, trans-specific knowledge sharing platforms that are respectful and inclusive of all identities within the trans spectrum. An example of this is we hosted trans two trans women and HIV research and practice conference where we brought together service providers and community members to have a dialogue about research and the needs of trans women and HIV and to build community capacity to provide competent care to trans women living with or affected by HIV. This space for learning has informed what we share with you today. And finally, our work has been informed by the Canadian HIV Trials Network, Trans People and HIV Working Group, that served the basis for the TEACH team. The work has not been possible without all the voices and perspective highlights through these groups, events, and teams who we are grateful to represent here today. Based on our history, you may not be surprised to hear the majority of our research focuses on trans women and people of trans feminine experience. We will also share research predom predominantly pertaining to sexual health and more specifically HIV prevention, care and support. But we will provide some resources pertaining to reproductive health. First, some background to our work. 
We know we are gathered here because of a shared recognition of the increased HIV vulnerability of trans communities globally, and even more so those experiencing intersecting oppressions. This increased HIV vulnerability can be understood through a social determinant lens of health that recognize the context of social and structural in inequity, limit trans people access to the social determinants of health, include reduced access to income, education, employment, and healthcare. These gaps in access in turn influence HIV vulnerability. Over the course of this presentation, we will highlight barriers and facilitators to both HIV care and gender affirming medical care, as we see gender affirming medical care as important to be integrated with sexual reproductive care for trans people. Access to uptake of HIV care is essential for health of women living with HIV. You have heard in other sessions, antiretroviral therapy or ART for short comes with many benefits, including reducing HIV related illness, mobility and age related mortality. There is a growing body of research which suggests that trans women living with HIV experience different care access including low retention in care, lower ART use, lower ART adherence, and low rates of viral suppression compared to cis people living with HIV. We also know that being able to affirm in one's gender is a social determinant of health for trans people. While not all trans people access medical gender affirmation, professional organizations that access is medically necessary to support the health and well being of those who require it. And this access has many positive effects on people, including improved mental health, as well as increased quality of life and resilience. Studies have shown that the social gender affirmations from HIV care providers, so things like using one's authentic name and pronouns and access to medical gender affirming care, such as hormone, facilitates HIV care engagement among trans people who are living with HIV. This is why we focus on both types of care as interwine. So before we share with you what the Chivos and Teach participants shared with us, we'll start by telling you about the study methods and the participants. The Chivos study drew on quantitative and qualitative data. The quantitative arm consisted of baseline data from Chivos. Trained peer research associates recruited self-identified women living with HIV aged 16 years or older in British Columbia, Ontario, and Quebec, enrolling 1,422 women total including 54 trans women. The mean age of participants was 41 years. The highest proportion of participants were white or indigenous followed by Latina and black African Caribbean. Most had personal incomes of less than $20,000 per year, which is considered to be below the poverty line in Canada. Women had been living with HIV for a mean of 11 years. Qualitative data were collected using semi-structured, in-depth individual interviews with 11 purposively selected trans women who completed the baseline Chibo survey. The qualitative subsample also included trans women living with HIV from each of the three study provinces, ranging in age from their 20s to 60s, of white, indigenous, or other ethnicity, inclusive of Latina, Black, African, Caribbean, and women of multiracial ethnicity, mostly living with HIV for more than 14 years. The second study, TEACH, was a community-based research project led by trans women with the aim of developing and pilot testing a workshop for health and social service providers to teach them about how to provide affirming and comprehensive sexual health care for trans women. The study had two phases, a formative phase and a pilot testing phase. During the formative phase, we held focus groups with 26 trans women and in interviews with 10 service providers. The focus group participants were a mean age of 41 years and the majority identified as trans women of color. The service providers held a range of roles from direct service to education to leadership. So taking into consideration the qualitative and quantitative findings from CHIWOS and the qualitative findings from TEACH, we've organized our data into four key areas. Barriers to HIV prevention, testing, and care, 
barriers to gender affirming medical care. Stigma and discrimination as a barrier to all types of health care, including sexual health care, and recommendations to improve sexual health care. First, our qualitative research with trans women and service providers has consistently highlighted both the fear of experiencing stigma and actually experiencing stigma as barriers to the uptake of HIV prevention, treatment, and care for trans women. For example, one participant said, accessing testing has been more or less positive. I think sometimes I avoid it because I expect to be mistreated because so much of healthcare has treated me like shit. One example of stigma is being asked inappropriate questions or questions about one's sexual practices without context. As this service provider explained, if you just asked how many sexual partners have you had, then that's not cool. But if you're like, I need to know, like, have you had more than five? Or I need to know if you do this sexual practice because it will influence the testing we will do for you today. Participants also qualitatively described how a lack of healthcare provider knowledge about HIV and trans care posed a barrier to uptake of HIV prevention and care. As this participant shared, even accessing like testing, I've always kind of felt like I needed to know what, you know, what the ins and outs of my healthcare was going to be, because I knew the chances are that the person that the healthcare provider that I was dealing with wasn't going to, and have very rarely been proven wrong by that. Moreover, participants recognized how a lack of trans-specific services and organizations posed a structural barrier to accessing sexual health care. From a quantitative perspective, drawing on data from 50 trans women living with HIV who participated in CHIVOS, our research has shown social and structural marginalization to be negatively associated with current ART use, including higher internalized HIV-related stigma, barriers to access to care, such as transportation and anti-trans stigma, as well as higher prevalence of insecure housing. Adherence to ART, on the contrary, was associated with more individual factors, such as depressive symptoms and PTSD symptoms, while both mental health factors, these are also largely driven by stigma. To put a spotlight on mental health for a moment, overall, about 50% of the participants in Chivos reported clinically significant PTSD symptoms and depressive symptoms. We found that internalized HIV stigma and ever experiencing violence were associated with more frequent depressive symptoms. Alternately, resilient sexual relationship power, social support, and less difficulty meeting housing costs were associated with less frequent depressive symptoms. These findings suggest the importance of addressing the holistic needs of trans women living with HIV from a strength-based perspective in order to optimize sexual health and well-being. In terms of our findings related to access to gender-affirming medical care for trans women living with HIV, a critical gap identified through TUOS analyses was that only about two-thirds of those currently taking ART who had informed their physician of their hormone use reported that their physician had discussed potential drug-drug interactions. Qualitative findings also showed that women who concurrently took ART and hormones had significant concerns about drug-drug interactions, and some participants reported adverse events, highlighting the importance of physicians discussing the co-administration of hormones and ART. Our research also illuminated how HIV health shapes and HIV stigma disrupts access to medical gender affirmation for trans women living with HIV. The qualitative results showed that good HIV clinical health was a prerequisite dictated by surgeons for accessing gender affirming surgeries. Qualitative findings also suggested that HIV stigma was institutionalized in policies that prevented trans women living with HIV from accessing surgeries and was enacted by providers, for example, by people providing electrolysis. Beyond the stigma already mentioned in relation to accessing HIV testing and prevention, as well as gender affirming care, we wanted to take a moment to really highlight and dig into the idea of intersecting stigmas. Participants in our studies consistently mentioned experiencing stigma in many healthcare settings based on multiple aspects of their identities, including gender identity, gender expression, HIV status, race, class, substance use, and sex work involvement. And these types of stigmas were experienced across various care settings, including emergency departments being notably challenging, 
and were perpetuated by all types of care providers, including nurses, physicians, lab technicians, and dentists, as well as by administrative staff. These quotes exemplify some experiences of the most common types of stigma. Important to note, this discrimination persisted and continues to persist in spite of federal protections against discrimination based on gender identity and universal health care in Canada. Participants talked about stigmatizing experience specific to these identities and then other specific to intersectional identities, which is exemplified in these quotes. As one participant said, because as soon as I get into the emergency room, it's like all the students and all the nurses want to see me. So uncomfortable. If one of them is transphobic and that person is like who is attending to you, it's the worst because everything they do to put the needle to talk to you to do this stuff for you is different and more imagine with HIV. So they treat you like a species from another planet. Finally, participants had many recommendations to improve sexual health care. Trans women and service providers highlighted trans affirming and trauma informed care, which they described as recognizing and interacting with trans women as women and acknowledging and addressing violence, stigma and discrimination. Participants also described the importance of being seen as a whole and valued person. A second recommendation was to promote autonomy and choice for trans women in selecting sexual health services. This included not assuming everyone needs sexual health care, listening to trans women's concerns, asking appropriate questions and explaining why you are asking, and offering alternate options for testing when available, such as home testing. As this provider described an alternative option for testing, the person will then go into the bathroom on her own and do the urine sample and swab and all of that. So they never actually have to get naked in front of the nurse. So that makes a big difference in terms of getting people to be comfortable getting tested. Participants also recommended trans inclusion and in service delivery and program development and oversight and increased provider education. Their narratives revealed who should receive education, including students, administrative staff, and physicians, what intersectional content for education should include, such as the social context affecting trans women living with HIV, and who should deliver the training, specifically trans and gender diverse people. So taking these important findings from the CHIWO study and the qualitative formative phase of TEACH, we developed the TEACH intervention, which was a three hour training uh, delivered by trans women to health and social service providers. So now we're transitioning into talking about the TEACH study a bit more. The TEACH training discussed human rights for and intersecting stigmas affecting trans women, affirming words to discuss gender identity and expression, basic understanding of trans health care, HIV prevention, and HIV treatment, HIV social movement, such as undetectable equals untransmittable or U equals U, HIV laws and policies, and strategies for enhancing gender affirming service provision with individuals and organizationally. The session also included time for discussion and questions and the completion of a case study designed from an intersectional perspective. We used a non randomized multi site pilot study with pre and post test design to examine the feasibility, acceptability, and changes in provider stigma, perceived competency, and knowledge. The workshop was piloted with 78 providers, mostly social service providers, some medical or allied health providers, and then some management, administrative, and research personnel. Notably, over one third and almost one quarter had no past trans specific training and no past HIV training, respectively, and 86% had no prior training specific to the needs of trans women and HIV, indicating our training filled a gap. The workshop was acceptable with 92% of participants stating that they would attend another training on trans women with HIV. The facilitators were rated most highly. The most helpful content was related to some of the trans 101 aspects, such as inclusive language. However, the participants also valued the more nuanced aspects related to health and human rights of trans women with HIV. Participants wanted more resources about PrEP, PEP, hormone therapy, and ART research, and more stories of lived experience. 
Overall, we saw positive changes in total scores from pre to post workshop on a measure we partially adopted, but mostly created to measure knowledge, attitudes, biases, and perceived competency to provide gender affirming HIV care, as well as knowledge, attitudes, and biases, and perceived competency to provide gender affirming healthcare more broadly, which were a very promising results we were really excited about. So building on the Chew, Listen, Teach findings, we have a lot of exciting projects on the go. That was just a bit of a snapshot of some of our key studies that pertain to our talk here today. Um, but we'll be currently uh, working on adapting and operationalizing a trans women and people of trans feminine experience HIV care model that takes into consideration sexual and reproductive health care, mental health care, and gender affirming health care, among other types of care. We've also been funded to conduct a drug-drug interaction study between feminizing hormones and ART to get people of trans feminine experience living with HIV the information they need to make informed and confident decisions about their health. In support of that study, we are also developing a questionnaire to measure trans women satisfactions with their hormone therapy, which may later be used to facilitate collaboration between trans women and their care providers. And in the US, Ashley is examining gender-based differences in non-HIV STI testing among trans and non-binary people with an emphasis on bridging gaps in research about trans masculine and non-binary people's sexual health care needs. Here is the last part of our presentation. We'd like to leave you with some practice implications. We're going to share with you five key strategies that stem from our research. Implement principles of intersectional, trans affirming and trauma-informed care across all aspects of care, including sexual and reproductive health care. Integrate medical gender affirmation and sexual and reproductive health care. Use evidence-informed practices of trans affirming sexual history, taking increased capacity of comprehensive trans affirming reproductive health care and offer holistic programs to support trans people living with affected by HIV, including those who experience intersecting oppressions. The first is to implement principles of intersection trans affirming and trauma-informed care across all aspects of care, including sexual and reproductive health care. The first and foremost means unpacking our biases expectation and assumptions about gender and other parts of our identities and recognizing diversity in experiences, desires, and access to social, medical, legal, and psychological gender affirmation. Importantly, providing intersectional trans affirming care means being an advocate, including and supporting those with a range of gender identities, including non-binary identities supporting patients through life transitions, strengthening social support systems, and building resilience. Intersectional trans affirming and trauma-informed care means taking a strength-based approach of embracing diversity, not pathology, while recognizing the stigmas that trans and gender diverse people living with HIV face, and the impacts that stigma has on health. This also means understanding intersectional oppression, trans people living with HIV, trans people of color, trans people living in poverty, trans people with episodic and chronic disabilities, and those that are intersection of those identities and experiences are all much more likely to experience stigma and discrimination and therefore face significant barriers to care. To that end, we must believe that trans people who disclose experiencing violence and discrimination can be prepared to make referrals to trans affirming mental health care. To that end, we must believe trans people who disclose experience violence and discrimination and be prepared to make referrals to trans affirming mental health care. We must also respect our client's autonomy by remembering that we can make our informed decisions about medical gender affirmation, as well as HIV prevention and treatment options and other aspects of sexual and reproductive care. Our second practice implication is to integrate gender affirming medical care and sexual and reproductive health care. We see these as intertwined, meaning that they care Providers need to be versed in hormone therapy and other aspects of medical gender affirming in addition to sexual and reproductive health. 
Our third su suggestion is to use evidence informed practices of trans or women's sexual history. Taking this means providing care on organs that are present, refraining from referring to body parts as male or female, asking clients what they prefer to call their body parts, or using technical terms and conducting routine screening based on the presence of absence of body parts. Some women have prostate, some men need pap tests. Language matters. Here we show off a schematic of less gender terms that can be used when interacting with trans men. There is a, this is a publicly accessible resource for taking a comprehensive trans affirming sexual history available through Fentway Health, a leading LGBTQ health organization. We have a link on, to on this slide. Here we show off eight Ps for clinical intervention and examples questions for each. For example, when asking about sexual preferences, one may ask, what kind of sex do you engage in? When asking about partners, one may ask, how would your partners identify themselves in terms of their genders? Specific questions are also shared for the remaining Ps, which include protection from STI, past history of STI. Pregnancy, pleasure, and partner abuse, it's important to ask open-ended questions from a non-judgmental stance. There are also best practices for before and after physical exams. Again, these are from the Fentway Guide. Before the exam, get to know the patient's prior experience, explain the purpose, and walk through all these steps, and ask what you can do to make it more comfortable for the patient. During the exam, take the trauma-informed approach, meaning asking for permission to touch, explain the length of time you will touch for and why, and collaboratively make a plan on how to proceed or stop if the exam becomes difficult or triggering. Our fourth suggestion is to increase provider competency for comprehensive trans and reproductive health care, which includes education on the effects of hormones and fertility, fertility preservation and contraception through attending specific trainings like that offered through the National LGBT Health Education Center, which we will share about in a moment. Lastly, given intersectional marginalization and gaps in access to social determinants of health among many of our participants, it is important to offer holistic programs to support trans people living with and affected by HIV, including those who experience intersecting oppressions. Some examples of these programs offered from the 519 in Toronto, Canada, where Yasmin works at a Trans People of Color project, Meal Trans, New Common Refugee, LGBT Support, and Trans Youth Mentorship Project. On these next few slides, we will list a resource, we'll list resources that can be helpful for learning more about sexual and reproductive health care affecting trans people along with associated links, such as to Rainbow Health Ontario, Trans Primary Care Guide, the WPAT Standards of Care, the Rainbow Health Ontario Guidelines for Gender Affirming Primary Care, and the Center for Excellence for Transgender Health website. We particularly draw your attention to two community developed resources, the Ontario Women and HIV Trans Inclusion Pocket Guide for Service Providers and Brazen 2.0, a safer sex guide for trans women, for trans women having trans specific sexual health materials on hand. Such as Brazen 2.0 is extremely important to provide relatable and relevant information and, improve, and promote inclusion of trans clients. The National LGBT Health Education Center also offers free webinar and trainings, many of which are relevant to these topics, including PrEP and transgender communities, HIV treatment and care for transgender people and gender diverse people, sexualities in healthcare, reproductive care, and the obstetrics care for transgender and gender diverse people, and many more. 
So as we wrap up today, we have a few key takeaways to leave you with. Sexual and reproductive health care and gender affirming medical care are parts of comprehensive primary care for trans and gender diverse people. Trans and gender diverse communities are not monolithic and it's important to not make assumptions, but instead to always listen to patients and clients about what they need. Interventions to increase access to sexual and reproductive health care are needed at provider and structural levels. Specifically, we need to train providers to be able to provide comprehensive and affirming care and ultimately to create environments where trans and gender diverse people living with HIV want to be. This may be more possible when we provide sexual and reproductive health care from the lenses of social determinants of health, intersectionality, and holistic care. As we wrap up today, we'd also like to honor and remember the 70 Chibos participants we have lost. Every time we share their stories is an opportunity to recognize their immense contributions with sincere gratitude. We would also like to thank all the community members involved in the Trans Women HIV Research Initiative, as well as the research coordinators and assistants, partnering clinics and funders who make our work possible. And we wanted to be sure to share with you citations from our papers that we used to make this presentation today. And if you have any further questions after the Q&A or would like to be sent our papers, please feel free to email any of us. We look forward to our discussion period and thank you for your attention today.